receive the presence of the Holy Spirit. We know that you're here. We sense you walking up and down this room. And as we come to this last session, we plead, Lord, that you will speak to our hearts still. You are, we're told, Lord, that no message is ever preached in which a soul does not go too far. Help us today to make that decision. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening. You know, it's a blessing for what our eyes have heard, amen? It's a blessing for what our ears have heard. We are told in inspiration that the accumulated light of the ages is shining upon us. And God wants in this last generation for you and I to do something that has never been done. Amen. Do you know that God is counting on us? That Jesus has literally put it in our hands that we can do something to bring the sufferings of heaven to an end. It's amazing that we have a disposition today that we believe that all of the suffering of Jesus ended in 31 A.D. We believe that when Jesus came off that cross, that when those nails came out of the hands of Jesus, we believe that when he breathed his last breath on Friday evening, that that pain stopped. But my brothers and sisters, that pain has not stopped. The pain that started what we saw in Gethsemane where the Bible says that he was sorrowful even unto death, that pain is still on the heart of God right now and nobody knows it but Seventh-day Adventists. You see, the Protestant world told us that Jesus died, that he went back to heaven and that he's all right, but Revelation says that he's still a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. In heaven, Jesus is still suffering. And today, our message has degenerated into something sort of a humanitarian belief. We're a little more than the YMCA. Someone says, no, we are not. Yes, we are. You know, a Christian started the YMCA. Our church has reduced to a club in which as long as you pay your dues, we call it tithes. You become a part of that club, but my friends, those who are just paying dues are getting ready to be shaken out. And God does not want anyone to be shaken out. God died so that every one of us could be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Should we not get him, give him what he paid for? I mean, tell me something. When you go to the store, you look at the box, and the box said you get a cord, you get a blender, you get something else in there, and then you get home and you open up the box, and all you see is a cord, you say something's wrong. I paid for the cord, for the blender, and all I got is a cord. What do you do? You go back to the store. Am I right or wrong? And you tell them, I paid for something more than that. Do you know, brothers and sisters, when Jesus went to the cross, he died so that every one of us could be restored back into his image. And when he looks at us still struggling in sin, he says, wait a minute, I paid for much more than that. How can you be struggling looking at desperate housewives? How can you be struggling on the internet, on pornography, in sin? And how can you do this to me? I paid to restore you back into the image of God. My brothers and sisters, Jesus paid much more than what we're giving him. And I don't know about you, but I want to give him what he paid for. We have but a few short months. There's no way I can tell you all I want to tell you. No, I want to tell you everything tonight. But there's no way I can do this. But I want to give you enough so that we can think to ourselves, Lord, I want to come to Jesus. Do you want to come to Jesus? My brothers and sisters, listen to me. There, there's those among us that call themselves seven evidence, even believers of present truth that have degenerated the three angels to a humanitarian effort. Look what the prophet says. There's a difference between a good work and a what? Now, the Salvation Army, are they doing something good, yes or no? You see them outside in front of Walmart. You see them in the front of their stores. You see them collecting money for the poor, for the homeless, for the needy, and this is necessary. Do you know that the Spirit of Prophecy talks about the Salvation Army? Somebody's, what? Yes. Sister White said, I saw that the Salvation Army is doing a good work, but she says, this is not the work of Seventh-day Adventists. 
We're not to condemn them. She says, many in the Salvation Army, they love God. And when they hear this message, they will come out. You see, God has given us something better than what the Salvation Army has. And when the sincere philanthropist hears the seven Adventist message, instead of wasting his money and just spinning it out, throwing it off for nothing, that man is going to give his money to the message that is going to finish the work. Because the man that loves souls wants to stop the suffering. And there's only one way to stop suffering. The end must come. I read one prophet that said unto 2,000 and 300 days finish it. Then shall the what? Sanctuary be cleansed. Look what it says. I must speak plainly in regard to some things which we must be guarded. She says, speak it plain. Constantly work is being done for the outcast, but this work is not to be made what? She's talking about that Salvation Army method. Then she says, although this is a what? Is it an evil work? Yes or no? No, it's not evil. It's good work. She says, in the last days, many are going to do many wonderful works, but they're still not going to know Jesus. It says, although this is a good work, it is not the work for the present time. It says, let the world do all it will in this line. Our time and means must be invested in a different line of work. We must be doing something different and better. This says, we are to carry the last message of mercy in the very best way to reach those in the churches who are hungry and praying for light. Do you know right now, all over the world and all the continents, people are hungry and praying for light. We get emails from all around the world, Fiji, islands out of the sea, people all over saying, please, we wish we had this message here. Who will come and teach us present truth? Look what it says. Man's feelings may become what? Now, let's, let's read it together. Amen. Uh, let's read it together. Well, you're not at the school of the prophets. Now you are. Amen. Let's read it together. What does it say? All together. Come on. Men's feeling may become deeply moved as they see human beings suffer. Watch now. As the result of their own course of action. There are those who are specially impressed to come into direct contact with this class. And the Lord gives them a commission to work in the worst place of the earth, doing what they can to redeem the outcasts and place them where they will be under the care of the church. But, is that a bad work? No. But the Lord has not called seven Adventists to make this work a specialty. He will not have them in this work and gross many workers who exhaust the treasury. While many he may do this here and there, God has given us something better, something different, something deeper, something to solve the ills of the world. It says this work is being made the all-absorbing work, but this is not in God's order. It is a never-ending work. Remember what Jesus said? He said, the poor shall be what? Always with you. Never ending. And it's amazing that, that, that there are many today believing that they believe present truth that are doing nothing more than Judas. Judas was a humanitarian. You remember Judas? Mary was preparing the body of Jesus to finish his work. And Judas said, why do you waste so much money on anointing Jesus? That bottle, a uh, box, alabaster box, that money could have been sold and given to the humanitarian. But he was not interested in finishing the work like Jesus was. Jesus said, never ending work. But then he says, and if it is carried on as it has been in the past, all the power of God's people will be required to counterbalance it. And the work, let's read this together. And the work of doing what? Preparing a people to stand amid the perils of the last days will never be done. The devil says, let them go out there and just feed the homeless. Let them go out there and just put clothes on people's back. Do you know, brothers and sisters, I was in one country where they make $5 a day or a week. And you know what those people, people were saying, oh, don't, don't try to tell them the truth. Why don't you just give them some food? This is what the people need most. I got in there and said, Lord, I'm going to give them what you told me to give them. Do you know what those people did? Those starving souls, they say, you know, people come here, ministers, and they start telling us that we need these food. He said, they said, I would rather starve and hear this message. The people in other countries starving for present truth more than food more than clothing. It draw tears to my eyes as I saw those dear souls hungry while here in America we are over increased with goods and feel like we don't need a thing. A crisis is coming. 
A storm is gathering all about us. And we are so comfortable that we can be in a church like this and be on our computers. Now, I'm not talking about taking notes. I'm talking about being distracted. Are you with me? We're going to be on our cell phones, not, 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 not following the Bible, but on our cell phones distracted by the devil. Only the devil would have us in a place like this being distracted because Jesus is talking to us. The world is coming to an end. Brothers and sisters, listen. For six hours or 6,000 years, question, how long has Jesus been on that cross? Somebody says, well, he was there for six hours. No, only, only just a little while. But my brother and sister, I present to you tonight that it was not six hours. Those six hours was just a symbol of the 6,000 years that sin would be on this earth. Look what the prophet says in the book of Education. Read this with me. This is the highest view. We must take our eyes off of the humanitarian effort and we must lift them up above humanity or into heaven. This is the highest unselfish view that we can have and it will not lead us to complacency. It will lead us to urgency. Look what it says. Education, page 263. Let's read it together. Those who think of the result of hastening. What does hastening mean? Speeding up. Those who think of hastening or what? What does hindering mean? Slowing down. Now, most of the times, when we think of fixing the work, finishing the work, moving it faster or slowing it down, we don't think of it in relationship to God. You know what we think? I don't want no more burnt toast. I don't want to have to go to work no more. I don't want to have all this suffering, all this sorrow. This is not the old, this is not the motivation. Look at this now. It says, they th uh, hindering the gospel, think of it in relationship to themselves and to the world. Few think of its relation to who? God. Few give thought to the suffering that sin has caused our creator. It says, all heaven suffered in Christ's agony. How much of heaven suffered? You mean to tell me that man is sometimes thinking of just suffering humanity? You know, we need to think of suffering Jesus. This says, all heaven suffer in Christ's agony. But that suffering, listen now, this is one of the most significant statements in the writings. Look at what this says. That suffering did not begin or end with his manifestation where? Amen. You mean to tell me that the suffering of Jesus did not start in Gethsemane? Didn't start there. You mean to tell me that the sufferings of Jesus did not end when he closed his eyes on Calvary? When did it start? It says, the cross is a revelation to our dull senses of the pain that from its very inception, sin has brought to the heart of God. When did sin enter? You remember, brother and sister, when that war came in heaven and that sin first started? You mean to tell me that Jesus has been suffering for six thousand years somebody says but but ministry couldn't be suffering that bad they didn't put no nails in his hands they didn't pull out any beard they didn't slap and spit in his face how could jesus be suffering that much it's because we don't understand god or an actual question about jesus was it the nail wounds that killed jesus was it the thorns that was placed upon his brow was it the nails that went on his feet and the spear that bruised his side that killed Jesus? Was that what did it? No. Before that, Jesus said, my soul is suffering even unto death. He sweat great drops of blood long before he was touched by humanity. And if the angel had not come, he would have died in Gethsemane. But he loved himself more than he loved, he loves you more than he loved himself. I mean, how is it that we don't even care about ourselves? We will let ourselves do anything. We can allow our minds to be diverted and distracted, and yet Jesus is focused on saving us. What does he see in us? Why do we mean so much to him? What is man that you are so mindful of us? This says that it did not begin. That suffering started with sin. Now, if it started with sin, that means that it will not end 
until sin is finished. Somebody, some generation must come on the scene that are through a sin so that Jesus can cleanse the sanctuary, blot it out so that sin can be no more, and then the sufferings of Jesus will come to an end. He's still suffering. Somebody says, I wish I could bathe his brow. I'll never forget the old lady, the story of the old lady. She was talking about how much she loved Jesus and how much everybody else didn't love Jesus. And one night, she went to bed, and God decided, decided to speak to her very plainly, and she went to sleep, and all of a sudden, she was on the scene watching Jesus. And she was there in the crowd. She saw Jesus being arraigned before Pilate. She saw Jesus being accused by a false accuser. Has you ever been accused by a false accuser? And you know what it feels like. Am I right or wrong? She saw Jesus being hit with the palm of his hand, spit at with the spit. Now listen, if you've never had somebody spit in your face, you don't understand this. Now you young brothers, please, I'm not going to warn you. Amen? She saw Jesus spit. They saw them spit in the face of Jesus. Now, if you ever had a man spit on you and you see the spittle run down your face, man, it make you mad. But Jesus, unaffected, that old lady, she tried to get into the crowd and stop it, but they kept her on the back. She trailed them as they were taking him, beating him and beating him. She saw him faint under the cross as she's trying to get there. I wish I can help him. Oh, Jesus, I wish I can help. And she's going everywhere. Then all of a sudden, she gets to the place where one man takes his hand and gets ready to smack Jesus in the face. And she says, no. And she grabbed the man's hand and she turned the man around and it was her that was slapping Jesus. You and I are the ones that's making him suffer right now. And can we can continue to watch what we're watching and listening to the music we're listening to and doing the things we are, kicking Jesus in the face when all Jesus wants to do is save us. This says that the cross is a revelation to our dull senses of the pain that from its very inception sin has brought to the heart of God every departure from the right, every deed of cruelty, every failure of humanity to reach his ideal brings grief to him. Do you want to stop that grief? I mean, think of it. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did ere such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Do you want to take Jesus off the cross? Do you want to? Then somebody must get victory over sin. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, forgive us for being so careless, Lord. With our words, with our thoughts, with our actions. Lord, even in a room like this, Lord, the devil would love for us to be distracted by everything. Talking, laughing, diversion. But, oh, Lord, in these next few moments, speak to every heart. Don't let anyone leave here and have an excuse that they never knew. Allow every one of us, Lord, to be able to run to Jesus. Lord, you know I can't do what needs to be done in these few minutes. We only have a few minutes, Lord. Give us something that will revive and reform us to see that unless we run to Jesus now, all else means nothing. For what should the profit a man to gain the whole world and to lose his soul? Lord, give us the power of the Holy Spirit and remove this fickle, free, feeble, frail flesh. Give us Jesus. And Lord, help every one of us never to become foolish virgins. And abide with us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll take your Bibles and turn to Revelation 12. In Revelation, the 12th chapter, and I want you to notice something very carefully in your Bibles. Pick up your Bible and watch this now. In Revelation 12, we find something very interesting. 
one of the most significant chapters in all of the Bible, the great controversy between Christ and Satan has been carried forward. <clears throat> but in Revelation 12, we notice that the storm is gathering, a storm that is threatening to unravel the very fiber and fabric of our society, a storm that is getting ready to shake America, that is getting ready to shake the world to its knees, a trouble that Daniel says, a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. And tell me something, we've seen trouble. Am I right or wrong? You think of World War I. Millions lost their lives. Think of World War II when they saw the atomic bomb and they saw how much devastation could be caused by the unleashing of an atom. Man said, truly, the world is getting ready to come to an end. Think of the genocides and the holocaust and the murders and the debaucheries and the killings and the stealings and the shootings. And yet the Bible says that all of this will pale into insignificance, into light of what's coming. Bible says a time of trouble such as never was and no one yet is ready to stand for this and the denominations know nothing about it. Christians in every church and yet Babylon has been confused and God has raised up the remnant church, the seventh day Adventist church to prepare a people to stand for this time. And the only denomination, the only church that has the light from heaven that has the message of the master, are afraid to practice and preach what they profess to believe. Only religion that is afraid to announce that we have a prophet. You know, there's no other religion like that on the face of this planet. You go to the Buddhist, and he'll tell you about the Dalai Lama. You go to the Jehovah's Witness, he will tell you of the Watchtower. You go to the Mormons and you can't get out of the third study before they will introduce to you Joseph Smith. Am I right or wrong? You go to the Muslim and he will tell you proudly of Muhammad. In fact, you talk about Muhammad, you might lose your life. You go to every other religion and they will tell you they have a prophet boldly. And then you come to the Seventh-day Adventists and they are afraid to mention Sister White. Afraid to even say she had the prophet to give. Oh, she's my favorite author, some say. It's a denial of the faith, brothers and sisters. And we're the only church that has a real prophet that has stood the test of time and Bible prophecy. And my brothers and sisters, the devil says, I've got to get rid of that church. And so he's doing everything in his power. And he knows that if he can just hold seven Adventists asleep just a little longer, then he's secure of us. He says, let the young person listen to Jay-Z just one more time. Let them listen to Beyonce one more time. And I got them. Let them listen to that rock song, that show, just one more. Let them think that the world's a party. The Bible says a time of trouble is coming. And only those who know Jesus are going to go through this time. Revelation 12 says that there's a people. Revelation 12, beginning in verse 17. You're there, amen? amen? Let's read verse 17. The Bible says, And the dragon, who's that? The devil. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the what? testimony of Jesus Christ. Do you know, brothers and sisters, that this pinpoints one church and only one? Seven-day Adventism. The commandments of God, testimony of Jesus, what is that? Revelation 19.10 says, this testimony is the spirit of prophecy. Manifested in these latter times. I remember one man when I first became converted, he said, and he found out the seven Adventists, he said, oh, you're one of those. And I said, yes. He said, I used to be. I said, why are you still not? Why are you not one now? He said, I used to be. He said, but now I'm a Protestant. Now, when he said that, I know what he meant. You know what he meant? He meant he no longer believed in the prophetic gift. He said, I'm a Protestant. I believe in the Bible and the Bible only. Brothers and sisters, you have to tell somebody like that, you don't believe the Bible. You are not a Protestant. You're a pretender. There's a difference. What do you mean? I said, I don't believe in the Bible and Sister White. I believe in the Bible. But when the Bible says, in the last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. When the Bible says, despise not prophesy. 
When the Bible says in the last days, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. When the Bible says that his last church is going to have the spirit of prophecy and you reject the prophet, it means you don't believe the Bible. It's the Bible that tells us this. This church is the seven heaven's church, but listen to me. The seven heaven's church has changed over the last few years. The church that God raised up in 1844 is not the church in 2013. The church that God raised up in 1844 in that first generation and gave the pillars of our faith. We're in a generation now of youth and adults that no longer see our signs. Those three angels have been stripped from us. The pillars of our faith have been systematically eroded and destroyed generation after generation to now. There's a generation who no longer knows what we believe. And let me tell you something. Whenever you have a generation that forgets its roots, it's preparing for extinction. Every time that slavery was introduced in any civilization, they always took the name. They always took the roots because when you take away a man's roots, you destroy the tree. And so the devil says, destroy the roots of Seventh-day Adventism. And right now, brothers and sisters, today he's almost destroyed it completely. And God says there must be a revival and reformation. You know there's a change. And you know right now as a church, we're sleeping. You know I'm telling you the truth. Am I right or wrong? And yes, we're sleeping. We need something to wake us up. You know what it is? When alarm sounds, alarm wakes up. But you know it's amazing. You know what you do when you hear that alarm? You know what you do. You, 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 I mean, I, I can be in your room. You, we go on an alarm, you put an alarm on, and you say, it's too early. You snooze. Am I right or wrong? Five minutes later, it goes off again. You snooze. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, listen to me. You be watching your shows, and a storm comes through. And it says, we interrupt the regular broadcast. And you say, what? Listen, our broadcast of regular life needs to be interrupted. We cannot continue going on with life as usual. In America, a crisis is coming that is going to start around the world. And there's only one people that understand this based on the book of Daniel and Revelation that this storm is going to break. And God has commissioned us to go to every nation and kindred and tongue and people and every denomination and preach a worldwide warning. But the devil is trying to kill us so that we can't give this message. But you know what the Bible says? Go to Revelation 18. What book did I say? Revelation 18. Let's go to chapter 18. Revelation 18. It's going to take something straight. Look what this says. Look what the prophet says. You're not afraid to read from the prophet. Amen? Spiritual gifts. Page 284. Listen to what the prophet says. It says, experimental religion is known by but a few. The shaking must soon take place to do what? To purify the church. Now, you know, God, we heard a, I don't know if you were there this morning, but we heard a wonderful sermon. Amen? Right now, heresy is sifting the church. There's a ministry to heresy. Amen? But do you know that God did not want heresy to do this? God's means was that you and I would preach and practice the straight truth and it would have got rid of the heresy without us even having to have heresy. This says preachers should have no scruples to do what? Preach the truth as it is found where? In God's word. It says let the truth do what? Now, the minister doesn't have to cut. The truth got to cut. But let me tell you something. If we're going to be healed, we must go under the physician's knife. We're afraid sometimes to go under the physician's knife, aren't we? You know, the things have to be cut out of us. Things that we're watching, things that we're doing, things that we enjoy, things must be cut away. Jesus said, if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. And if the internet offend thee, guess what? Cut it off. If the Facebook offend thee, cut it off. Some, oh, I'm doing ministry on Facebook. Tell me the truth. <laughs> Souls are being lost on Facebook. And if you tell me that you won one soul on Facebook, I'll show you a million that died on Facebook. This says, let the truth cut. I have been shown that why ministers have not more success is they are afraid of hurting feelings. You know, that's the wrong with the ministry right now. We are afraid of hurting feelings. We want to be popular. 
I tell you, when you preach the truth straight, it doesn't make you popular. As I said before, it may secure you an occupation, but it will not cause a reformation. This says, I have been shown why they don't have more success. They're afraid of hurting feelings, fearful of not being courteous. So what do they do? They lower the standard. They say, oh, seven Adventists don't really believe that. There's no difference between seven Adventists and any other church. Seven Adventists don't believe it. Oh, no, they lower the standard to secure numbers. But my brothers and sisters, God will not accept a lower standard. It says, when the enemy comes in like the flood, Isaiah says, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard, raise the standard high for the Lord. It says, they lower the standard of truth, and what do they do? Conceal, if possible, the peculiarity of our faith. What does conceal mean? High. What does peculiarity mean? Difference. In other words, the Bible says we are peculiar people. 1 Peter 2.9 says we're peculiar people. And my brothers and sisters, the devil wants to lower the standards so that we look just like everybody else. And do you know today there was a time when seven heavens looked different, but not today. I was going to another country to do some meetings just a few weeks ago. We got in the airplane. Lady sat beside us. She was going out of the country. And she said to us, and she started talking, she found out through my wife, she was a seven Adventist. She said, I used to be a seven day Adventist. She was a Pentecostal now. She said, but, but, but let me tell you something. Your church still has me come back to teach their women how to be women. What is, why, how, how, how can we allow this? This woman said, she said, but I noticed something. She said, your church has changed. She said, where I'm from, your church was respected by the government. She said, where I'm from, your church was suspected, respected by the community. She said, where I'm from, when a man saw a seven at Venice, they believed that they were Christians. They didn't go to some places. They didn't wear certain clothes. They didn't talk certain talk. She said, but that's not the same now. She said, I noticed that you're just like everybody else. I wanted to cry. But I had the truth. Praise God. Jesus has the truth. What do you say? And Jesus said, well, you can help them right now. And it was a blessing. My wife was there, was talking to this woman, was able to share the truth. And she talked to her, walked down the truth for this time. That woman with conviction in her heart said, yes, it is true. You got it. I need to come back. Yes, you need to come back. Amen. Jesus is getting ready to have a church where there's one. You know, right now, we're told that the majority of true Christians are not in the Seventh-day Adventist church. We're told that the majority of true Christians are in the Catholic church. Baptist church, Presbyterian church, Lutheran church, non-denominational church, they're there, but they don't know what's coming. They don't understand what's getting ready to get placed, and we're told that the greatest devils are in the Seventh Avenue church. And God says, there must be a shaking. You have sheep in Babylon and goats in the remnant church. How do you know the difference? Not by denomination. The way Jesus knows who is his is not by religious denomination or church affiliation. He knows who is his by the way we respond to the word of God. My sheep hear my voice. And if you're a seven Adventist and you don't hear the word of God, you're not God's sheep. You're a goat in the right church. But God has sheep in other churches, and when they hear it for themselves, they study it. I saw a Catholic priest. Then when he heard this message, he left the priesthood and said, I didn't know the truth. One of the meetings, somebody said, you're preaching too hard about the church. Seven Adventists. They said, how can you come here preaching so hard? Don't you know the Catholic church are going to think you're bashing them? Don't preach like that. I said, I'm going to tell what the Bible says. You know what happened? A Catholic was there came up after the meeting. He said, I've never heard truth so clear. Can I have some more? I said, yes. Seven day Adventists fighting the Bible while Catholics are eating it up. There was a time we had a standard on dress. When, when you saw a woman, you knew she was a seven day Adventist. You knew she was a queen. Let me tell you something. It's not hard to know how viable a man is. When you have something viable, you know what you do to it? Listen to me. 
when a man buys a car, expensive car, he doesn't want no acid rain hitting it. Am I right or wrong? What do you do to it? Tell me what do you do to it? He covers it up. You tell a little kid, on the, when he's bringing a report back to his house, to the school, and the, little, the teacher don't want no peanut butter and jelly on the report, do she? So she says, put a cover page on it. Think about it, brothers and sisters. When you get your cell phone that you paid money for it and you don't want to mess it up, what you buy for the cell phone, you buy a cover for it. Am I right or wrong? Now, dear sisters, when you go out and get your hair done and you pay good money for it and it's getting ready to rain outside, what do you do to your hair? You cover it up. Everything in the world that we consider valuable, we cover it. And our women, which is the most valuable thing that God has given us, we expose it. Exposing the cleavage. Exposing the legs. Teaching our young girls that they're not precious. You see, when a woman understands how valuable she is, she immediately covers herself. Our young girls are precious. Princess. Queens, and the moment we treat them like one, you will see a difference. My brothers and sisters, there was a time when there was a change in us. There are differences. Everything we see, there has been a change in every standard that God has given us. There has been a change. You know, when the world looked at us, there was a time when seven Adventists. Do you know that there was a time when every church used to not wear jewelry? Did you know that Christian churches? The Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal. Even today, you have Pentecostal, don't wear jewelry, based on the Bible. There's a shame. One lady we knew, uh, she gave out one of our evangelistic meetings, and she gave it out to a lady. And when she gave it to the lady, the lady picked it up from another denomination, and she, she, she was reading it and, and listening to the message. She called the lady back, and she said, what is this? The lady thought she, she was getting upset. What is this? The lady said, I, I was listening to a message. What, what happened? She said, this man was talking about dress and adornment from the Bible. She said, she said, are you all right? She said, yes. Is this man a holiness preacher? Woman went to a holiness church. She said, no, he's a seven Adventist. He said, she said, no, he can't be a seven Adventist. She said, yes. Why, why do you say no? She said, he can't be a, why? She says, I live in the midst of a town of seven Adventists and not one of them dressed like this. And you're talking about we're going to win the world? How are we going to win the world unless there's a difference? Do you know, brother and sister, listen to me. A great change is getting ready to come. This little group, seven Adventists represent, we have 20, 17 million people worldwide. Seven billion people on this planet. 80 million people, babies born every year. We represent less than one-tenth of the world's total population. But yet we're told that in just a little while that a change is going to take place and the world is going to fasten their attention upon seven-day Adventists. CNN, Fox News, the world, its stations are going to be zeroing in. Change of events is going to take place and they're going to be looking at seven Adventists because seven Adventists are going to be preaching a truth that the world has never heard. They're going to hear that Babylon represents the Protestant churches that have rejected the message of the threefold angels of Revelation 14. They're going to hear that God's holy law is still binding and that church and state are going to unite in America and enforce what is called a national Sunday law to try to bring America back to God. You heard what the man said at the Newtown shooting? What was the man's name? Huckabee. You ever heard of Huckabee? After the Newtown shooting where that young boy came into an elementary school and with semi-automatic weapons killed over 19 children, over six adults, that man, that young boy then killed himself. They asked, what happened? Where was God? You know what Huckabee said? He said, you already threw God out of this country. He said, when you took prayer out of schools in the 60s, you took God out of this country. And until you get God back into the country, don't ask where God is. He said, what we need is to return back to God. We're getting ready to see this, brothers and sisters. 
Everything we've heard from the Bible is getting ready to take place, and God is going to raise up Seventh-day Adventists that are going to be going from city to city, from country to country, to remote places. Our faces are going to be lighted up with the power of God. Miracles are going to be wrought. The sick will be healed. Many undeniable works will follow the believers. They're going to preach a message with clarity, and the world is going to listen. The Bible says that this church is going to appear fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners. My brothers and sisters, before God can do this, there must come a shaking. Look at Revelation chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. What does it say? Revelation 18, beginning in verse 1. You're there, amen? Verse 1, the Bible says, and after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven. That word angel means messenger. Here's a messenger preaching a heavenly message. He says, having great power, the earth was lightened with his glory. It got the attention of the world. Verse 2 says, and he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, what did he say? Let's say it together. Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils. Babylon Listen now, a woman in Bible prophecy, we study the text, represents a church. A pure woman represents a pure church, God's church. An impure woman represents an apostate, a false church. And the Bible told us of the pure woman, Revelation 12. False woman, Revelation 18. The Bible says it's going to become the habitation of devils. Can you imagine that? A church that houses devils. And the Bible says... In verses 3, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have done what? When a man commits fornication with a woman, he joins himself with that woman. So when the Bible says that a church will commit fornication with a king or a government, this is the prophetic symbol of a union of church and state. This is the passing of a national Sunday law. And the Bible says at that time that God's people are going to give a cry to the churches on the world. Verse 4 says, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, do what? Come out of her who? You mean to tell me that in all of these false churches, God has some people. Habitation of devil, but he says, my people. In every church, every denomination, God has some people, and God needs the remnant to wake up a sleeping church, to go around the world and teach it. But first, the remnant must wake up. This says, come out of her, my people. Now, I want to ask you a question. Where must the man be? Where must the man be that calls somebody out? He must be out himself. Is that right? Um, Babylon is going to take control of every city. You read Revelation 14, uh, Revelation 14 and Revelation 17, it says that Babylon reigns over the kings of the earth. She is that great city. So if we come out of Babylon, not only are we going to leave the churches, we're going to leave the cities that have been controlled by Babylon. We're going to come out. Do you know we're told in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy that every major city is getting ready to see a crisis? I would hate to live in Atlanta in just a few months. You think of how hard it is just to go up these streets when you have a traffic jam. What is going to take place when a revolution breaks out in Atlanta? You cannot move. You think it's bad trying to get home from work. You wait until a few months. What's going to take place in Los Angeles? What's going to take place in New Orleans? What's going to take place in New York? What's going to take place in all of the cities across this planet? We are told, brothers and sisters, that a crisis is coming. Warn the people of the danger. These cities are getting ready to be destroyed. And the world doesn't know it. We're just like Lot now. We're saying, oh, it's going to be destroyed. And we say that like one that mocked. I'm going to show you by God's grace that something is getting ready to take place. You know what the prophet says? Every what? How many? Every seven Adventists is to be to the world what Joseph was in Egypt and what Daniel and his fellows were in Babylon. Volume 6, 2, 19, and a prophet said that. Now, my brothers and sisters, listen to me. What did Joseph do in Egypt? When Joseph got down to Egypt, did Joseph tell them that a time of trouble was coming? Yes or no? Pharaoh had the dream. You know the story. You can go back to Genesis. You can read it in 30, and you can read it in 39 and 40 and 41 all the way through. Joseph had a dream. Pharaoh, Pharaoh had a dream and Joseph interpreted it. For you remember the dream? Some fat cows and some skinny cows. Some fat corn and some skinny corn. Seven, what do they represent? 
Seven years of plenty and seven years of trouble. Joseph said, a time of trouble is coming to Egypt. Now question, every seven Adventists do this. You mean to tell me that what Joseph did in Egypt, we're to tell America and the world that a time of trouble is coming? But is that all Joseph did? Did he tell him that? Tell me. Did Joseph say that an economy was getting ready to fail? Do you know that the Bible says that Joseph said that the money was going to collapse? Have you ever read in the Bible? No, you haven't read, have you? Let's look at it. Go, go to Genesis. Let's go to Genesis. Genesis chapter 47. What book did I say? Let's look at it in the Bible. I can tell by your face you didn't believe me. Amen. Let's look at it. Genesis. Genesis chapter 47. Here's Joseph. Genesis 47. Beginning in verse 13, look at what it says, Genesis chapter 47. Look at what it says now. Bible says it, Genesis 47, beginning in verse 13, Joseph foretells the trouble. And in the midst of this trouble, he foretold an economic collapse. Verse 13, the Bible says, and there was no breath in all the land, bread in all the land, for the famine was what? I'm going to let you know something. Atlanta is getting ready to come to a place where there's no bread, no food in Atlanta. And somebody says, I can't believe it. I remember one time when a prophet said, in a little while, there's going to be a famine. The prophet said, that will never happen. Prophet Elijah said, well, you will live to see it, but you will not benefit from it. Some of us are going to be made to believe this, not by salvation, but by damnation, because we didn't respond. And when the revolution breaks out, we will say, Lord, you warned us of it, but I did not respond. Genesis 47, the Bible says in verse 13, and there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very sore, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. Verse 14, let's read it together. The Bible says, and Joseph did what? Gathered up all the money. There was a centralizing of wealth that was found in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan for the corn which they bought. And Joseph bought the money into Pharaoh's house. So first, there was a centralizing of wealth, and then there was a collapse. Next verse. Verse 15. And when, what's the next two words? Money failed. In the land of Egypt. Remember now, every, with every seven Adventists, what Joseph did in Egypt, every seven Adventists is to do to the world. We're to tell the world that their money is getting ready to fail. We're to do this. You know why? Listen to me. Before the Sunday laws pass, before the mark of the beasts is in force, the money must fail. How do we know? Revelation tells us so. Where does it say it? Revelation 13. Let's go to Revelation 13. This is not something just for Joseph, but you and I in these last days. In Revelation 13, the Bible tells us that this crisis is getting ready to break upon us. And do you notice, brothers and sisters, today, man would do anything for money. The Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. That means that the bottom of all of our problems is the love of money. And you know that's the truth. Am I right or wrong? Man will wake up early in the morning, go to job, go to his work. Man, I mean, here in Atlanta, you wake up at 4 or 5 o'clock to get the job. But yet we won't wake up to talk to Jesus. We can go to the theater for two hours, three hours, and yet we spend no time praying and studying the Bible. What has happened to us? How, listen, what has the devil done for us to make us so loyal to him? What has he done? That we will wear his clothes, eat his food, listen to his music, think his thoughts, enjoy his music, enjoy his amusements, and say away with Jesus who died on the cross for us. You see those hands? I look at myself. Do you know, brothers and sisters, if years ago, I thought I was cool looking like a fool. I was on the streets, hair braided back, pants hanging down, thinking I was a thug. And Jesus saved my life. How in the world can we work for the devil when he's done nothing for us? Children, right now I remember I was in Chicago, we were doing meetings. Children six and eight trying to sell drugs to me. Six and eight doing drive-by shootings. Six and eight 
They can remember these R&B and rap songs, and yet today we have Christians that don't even know a verse in the Bible. And we say our children are too young. That's foolishness. How do I know? When you have a problem with your phone, you know who you ask? You ask that little child. You have a problem with your DVD player, who you ask that little child? You have a problem with your computer, who you ask that little child? And then you tell him he can't understand the Bible. We have deceived ourselves. The devil says, the younger, the better. My brothers and sisters, Revelation 13 says that the money is getting ready to fail. Just before the mark of the beast. Look at what it says. Revelation 13, beginning in verse 16, what does it say? It says, and he calls of what? All, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a what? Mark. This time of the mark of the beast. In their right hand or where? In their foreheads. Verse 17. Let's read that together. And the Bible says, and that what? How many? No man. This is the Bible. I didn't say it. The Bible says it. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that have the what? Mark or the name of the beast, or the name of his name, the Bible says, there's coming a time just before the mark is in force, the Sunday law pass, when those who do not have it will not be able to buy or sell. Question, is that economy in place tonight? Answer carefully. Answer carefully. Study the Bible. Is that economy in place tonight, yes or no? If you say yes, let me see your hands. If you say yes, that comes in place tonight. Let me see your hands. If you say that economy is not in place tonight, let me see your hands. Listen to me. That economy is not in place tonight. How do we know? The Bible says, and that no man might do what? Question. You may, if you're an atheist or an Adventist, can you buy or sell tonight? If you're a Buddhist or a Baptist, can you buy and sell tonight? Whether you're a Christian or not, you can buy and sell tonight. But the Bible says there's coming a time before the mark of the beast is passed, Sunday law, that, that no man will be able to buy or sell. That means that that economy is not in place right now. But it tells me that before the Sunday law is passed, that the present economy must do what? Collapse. So that a new economy can be introduced in which no man can buy or sell. Let me tell you something. This is getting ready to happen right now. Did you know that just before January 1st, all you heard from the White House was fiscal cliff? Am I right or wrong? Fiscal cliff. And you thought that by getting Dem Democrats and Republicans together, they saw that fiscal cliff. Let me tell you something. The economy is already over the cliff. And there's no return. The Bible says it. We have the DVDs. We can't go through it all tonight. We studied it this week. We have it on the DVDs. Brothers and sisters, this economy cannot revive itself. It's a band-aid. Listen, that debt ceiling is getting ready to be hit again in just a few months. If they raise it, just another few months. And the more you raise it, the worse it is. The higher it goes up, the greater the fall. It's going to make the crash of 1929 look like days of prosperity. And do you know what's going to happen in the cities when that takes place? A revolution. You don't believe me. You look over there at Egypt and you say, oh, they just toppled Gaddafi. That would never happen in America. You look over at Libya and you say that would never happen in America. You look over in Greece and you say that would never happen in America. You look over at Yemen and you say that would never happen in America. You look over at Northern Africa and Southern Asia. But let me tell you something, that is worldwide and it's coming to a country near you. In just a few short months. God said the seven evidence of the warning, but let me tell you something. Seven evidence must not only warn the world, they must provide the solution. Joseph not only told them that a trouble was coming. Joseph not only told them that the economy was going to collapse, Joseph showed them that there was a way out, there was a solution, and God has given the solution to seven-day Adventists. And it's to be given to the world. Listen. God is going to have some outposts. Look at what this says. We don't have time to talk about it now, but I want you to read this. Look what this says. This says, repeatedly, the Lord has instructed us that we are to work the cities from what? Outpost city centers. 
You know, this is a strange word to many seven Adventists. That we were not to live in the cities. We were to live in the country and work the cities. From outpost, why? Because you want to see what's going to happen in the cities. Do you want to see what's happening in these cities? Do you want to see? Do you want to see yes or no? This says, in these cities, we're to have houses of worship as memorials for God, but institutions for the publication of our literature, for the healing of the sick, for the training of the workers, are to be established outside the cities, especially in the, is it important that our youth shall be shielded from the temptation of city life? I feel bad for our young people. It is almost impossible to raise them in the cities. You look by the billboard, the billboard is telling them to go to hell. I didn't say in those words, it makes it look pretty. It says that it's cool to drink uh, uh, Heineken. Say it's cool to smoke. Say it's cool to, 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 to get the Newport. All of these things are you're being bombarded in our brains. They see the lifestyle and our young people are being killed in front of our very eyes. This says it is in harmony with the instruction that publishing houses and the sanitariums at these centers have been established away from the congested heart of the cities as outpost centers. This is the... You see, the man that calls people out of Babylon, he must beware. Out. Where is he going to be out in? He's going to be in an outpost. He's going to be hid in Christ. He's going to be following the plan that God has given him so he can finish the work as God has given us. This tells us there is no change in the message that God has sent in the past. The work in the cities is the essential work for this time when the cities are worked as what? God would have them. You mean to tell me God has a way to work the cities? And it's not from living in the cities. You know what some people say? Well, you got to live in the cities. Who's going to be on the front lines? I'll never forget when you start talking about, well, I'm going to be a soldier on the front line. That's what Lot said. And Lot almost lost every one of his family members. He lost his daughters that were married to other husbands, unequally yoked, and there in Lot and Sodom. Two daughters that got out, and then his wife, wife, before she fully made it out, looked back. Can you imagine? She had all of her nice furniture in Atlanta. She had all of her nice cars in Atlanta. He had all of his uh, tournaments and things there in Atlanta. He didn't want to leave. We're told that it was because that Lot lingered that his wife was lost. Because husbands won't be men. You know what our problem is today? We have very few men left. And just because a person's a male doesn't mean they're a man. A male can make a child, but a man takes care of his child. It takes a man to lead his family to morning and evening worship. Somebody said, I'm a man because I make money. You're not a man because you make money. A donkey can make money. Someone says, but I do it. I'm a breadwinner. Listen, the Bible says, man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word are you leading your family to the word of God. Because if your family is lost, God is going to look over your children that have been playing in church. Your children, your wives that have been turning their backs on the truth, they're going to go first and say, Adam, what did you do? And there's going to be no excuse. You know how many men are going to suffer the judgment of God because they won't be faithful. But I'm so glad that there's a revival and reformation. What do you say? I'm so glad we messed up. We can come to Jesus tonight. Can Jesus help us? Can we do it without him? Is this why he went to the cross? Is this why he died? Without me, you can do, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It says we must work the city as God designed them. Now listen, Lot. Lot lost his family. But listen, Abraham lived in the country. Who was the one that saved those people in the city? Was it Lot? Abraham in the country with his outpost saved the city. We can do more for God if we follow his plan. And this says... When the cities are worked as God would have them, the result will be the setting and operation of a what? You know, the only time that you find inspiration in the words mighty movement is connected with the loud cry of the third angel's message. With the what? That's the last message. So this says, then when we work the cities properly, the loud cry is coming. Is working the cities properly, I say it respectfully, just handing out a million books around the world. Is that the way we're to work the city? Now, they should include some passing out of books, but let it be the real book. Amen? Now, why do I say that? 
Somebody gave me a, 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 somebody gave me the book called The Great Hope, and I, I, I don't say it to try to talk down on the book, but somebody gave me the book Great Hope, and I looked at it, and I took my great kind of verse, and I started reading, and then I noticed that the same words were not even there. Have you compared it? The same word, I'm saying, wait a minute, this is not, I'm reading quotations, I know it's there in my mind, I'm reading, say, this is not it. And I turned to the front, and it said, adapt it. That's cold word for we put our words in it. If God wrote the book, leave it the way he wrote it. Amen. Now, my brothers and my sisters, this says the Lord will give to our sanitariums whose work is already established an opportunity to cooperate with him in assisting newly established plants. Every new institution is to be regarded as a sister helper in the great work of proclaiming the third angel's message. God has given our sanitariums an opportunity to set where? In operation of work that will be as a stone instinct with life, growing as it is rolled by an invisible hand. Let this mystic stone be set in motion. Now, what's going to happen when you set that mystic stone in motion? Watch. You see that mystic stone. You don't see the stone. Do you see the stone? That mystic stone is the outpost center of life and ministries that's going to finish this work. We're to get out of these cities and work these cities from country outposts. Brother and sister, it goes on. I'm going to keep going. Somebody says, but time is too short. You know what the prophet says? Some may say, if the Lord is coming so soon, what need is there to establish schools and sanitariums and food factories? What need is there for our young people to learn trades? It is the Lord's design that we should constantly improve the talent he has given us. We cannot do this unless we use them. The prospect of Christ's soon coming shall not lead us to idleness. Instead, it should lead us to do all we possibly can to bless and benefit humanity. What do you say? If we really believe Jesus is coming, shouldn't we have more publishing houses that will spread the gospel on the lead like the leaves of autumn? Am I right or wrong? More places of healing. More places to teach and preach and heal and publish because Jesus is coming soon. Do you believe that? My brothers and sisters, this great crisis is coming. And God is trying to prepare us for it. But listen to me. Do you know we're told that the majority of us are going to be just like foolish virgins? Do you remember the foolish virgin in the Bible? How many of them? Where, what chap, what book of the Bible do we find that parable? Let's turn there. Matthew 25. Heavenly Father, as we get ready to bring this message to a close, I plead with thee, dear God, that you will show us the truth and help us to respond that we will not be foolish virgins. In Jesus' name, amen. In Matthew chapter 25, notice what the Bible said. Jesus was getting ready to leave. He was getting ready to die. There was only a few days left, and Jesus said, let me give them a parable because I only have a few more days with them. And if Jesus only had a few days with you, this is what Jesus would say. Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 1, you remember the setting. Matthew 24, you remember the setting? The disciples came to Jesus, and they said to him, after they heard him talk about the destruction of the temple, they said, let, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of my coming and of the end of the world. They said, tell us, what are the signs that are going to lead up to your coming? What is going to take us to the end of the world? And in Matthew 25, the Bible tells us that Jesus is talking about the end times. Now, if you study it carefully, Matthew 24 is largely dealing with the signs that lead up to the crisis. And Matthew 25 is dealing largely with the experience, the preparation to go through the crisis. Matthew 25, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, then. What's the first word? Amen. Study the Bible word by word. When it says then, you need to know what do you mean. Then, because of the time, it was just talking about what was the time frame. It was talking about the wicked servant that said that the Lord delayeth his coming. You ever heard that? Somebody said, Mitt Romney didn't win the election. Praise God. God is holding back the winds of strength. The Lord is delaying his coming. Let me tell you something. The Lord didn't delay his coming. It doesn't matter who's the president, this crisis is coming. And by the way, we should be careful who, we, who you think you vote for. Amen. You don't want me to tell you straight, do you? You don't want me to tell you straight. Do you want me to? Do you know what the prophet said about voting? No, you're not ready for what the prophet said about voting. We're told to be ambassadors. Am I right or wrong? We're told that we don't even have a citizenship. Our citizenship is in heaven. It's impossible. For a citizen of another country to vote in America unless he has a citizenship. 
Now, an ambassador, yes, you can. That's right. And they won't let you vote. <laughs> Only a city citizen can vote. Is that right? Now, listen to me. Listen to me. My brothers and sisters, do you know that if we really believe the Bible, we wouldn't even waste time voting? In fact, if you study prophecy, you find out that the man who's the president does not even push the buttons. The Bible says that the borrower is servant to the lender. Proverbs 22, 7. Let me tell you something. 2008, oh, President Obama raised more money that was ever seen in any president election in the world at a time of the worst economic crisis in the world. My question is, where did the money come from? I did some research. And I found out the chairman of his board, if I said his name, you would know exactly who he is. He owns a lot of money. In fact, I was reading a newspaper. They said the day we were coming back from uh, New York somewhere. And I was reading a newspaper. And the newspaper said, you know, the, the newspapers are slick. You've got to watch the newspaper. I'm reading a newspaper, and it said that the, the, the Rockefeller Foundation, you know who they are? It said the Rockefeller Foundation is the institute to tell the public how your economy is doing. You won't believe what they tell you. If you understood the history of the Federal Reserve, I wish we had time just to walk it down. Brother Mason, talking about the history of the Federal Reserve, you think it just came in? Brother and sister, it happened very sneakily in 1913. You, you read what happened in Jekyll Island, Georgia. I've been there. You listen and understand. This is history when you go back. And the Bible told us it would happen. You know the Bible speaks of the Federal Reserve? I wish we had time. Proverbs Solomon knew about it. In the last days, now my brother and sister, listen to me. We are told one of these rich men, somebody says, oh, Bill Gates is rich. Bill Gates is not the richest man in the world. It's amazing what we think. You think you're going to know who the richest man in the world is. <laughs> We're fools sometimes, amen. <laughs> richest man in the world, stay back, you don't know who they are. Somebody said to one of these rich men, why don't you become president? He said, president? I choose president. Isn't that what he said, Brother Mason? I choose presidents. The borrower is servant to the lender, the Bible says. You've got to know who prints your money. You've got to study history. And the devil don't want you to know history. And so he made you so all you want us to do is look at entertainment. We're an entertainment generation. Anytime we pick up a book, we pick up a book that tells us about a movie. A book that tells us how to play a video game. A book that will tell us how to do anything about amusement, but never something that's going to tell us what's getting ready to take place in this world. That book of all books we put down for the world. And my brothers and sisters, we've been told that this crisis would take place. We all need to study as never before the parable of the ten virgins, the prophet says. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. She says, when the third angel's message preached says it should be power attend this proclamation, and it becomes a divine influence, it must be attended with divine power or it will accomplish what? Nothing. It says, I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins. How many times? Once or often? Often. Five of whom were wise and five were foolish. The parable has been and will be. I love the way the prophet writes. Don't you like the way the prophet writes? The pro it says the parable has been and what else? What does that tell us? That this parable has a dual application. I used to study Great Controversy. And I would say, oh, man, look at the past. Then I would study Christ's object lesson. And, oh, look at the future. And I got confused until I put them together and found out that it has a dual application. Great Controversy tells us the parables of the past. Christ's object lesson tells us of the future. And when you put them together, you got it all. Now, my brothers and my sisters, this parable applies specifically to Seventh-day Adventists. Historically, Adventists. Future, Seventh-day Adventists. Very careful. It has nothing to do with Babylon. Nothing to do with the other churches. How do I know? Because there are ten virgins. And the last time I checked, there's a difference between a harlot and a virgin. Am I right or wrong? So these parables applies to you and I. And watch what Jesus says. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter, for it has a special application to this time, and like the third angel of Angel's message, has been fulfilled and will continue to be present truth to the close of time. This is present truth. What do you say? Matthew 25 says, verse 1, Then 
shall the kingdom in the last days of heaven shall be like a ten virgins which took their lambs and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Tell me, when you're talking about a virgin, a virgin, we found a woman represents a church. A virgin is those who profess a pure faith. It's a pure church. Represents my brothers and sisters in the last days, seven devils. Now the Bible says, five, verse two, it says it took their lamps. What is a lamp? Talk to me. What is a lamp? The Bible says in Psalms 119, remember now, the Bible explains itself. We don't have to make it up. In Psalms 119, 105, the Bible says that the word of God is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. So this lamp in parable represents Christians, seven Adventists, going out with the word of God or the Bible. Is that clear? And then it says, they took their lamps and went forth to do what? Meet the what? Who is the bridegroom? Who is the one that the church is getting married to? Who is the one? Jesus. So they went forth prepared to meet Jesus. These were Adventists. Advent, the Latin word that just means coming. That's all. So if any denomination believes in the coming of Christ, they're Adventists. If an evangelical believes in the coming of Christ, he's an Adventist. He needs to become a seventh Adventist, understanding the principles. Are you with me? Now this says that they went forth to meet the what? Bridegroom, that means that they were preparing to meet Jesus. Are you with me? They come with their Bibles. But then the Bible says in verse 3 and verse 2, and five of them were wise and five were... Now, question. How many all together? Ten. Only ten. Question. Why did Jesus use ten versions? Have you ever let your mind wonder about that? Why ten? Well, when you study the Bible, you'll find out that God gave a pro pro prophecy in Daniel 2 talking about the image, like a man. Then he said at the very end of it, there will be how many toes? Just like a man's toes, ten toes. You go to Revelation, you know it's a fact because you're Revelation and you see the same powers. And guess how many kings are in Revelation? Ten. Guess how much the Bible says those ten kings represent? If you were to go to Revelation 16 and read in verses 14, 15, and 16, it says that those kings represent the whole earth. How much? So I wonder if 10 represents wholeness. Now remember 10, how many commandments? How much of the duty of man? Fear God and keep his commandments for it represents, uh, because, it, because it is the whole. How much of the duty of man? The, so the 10 represents the whole. So in other words, he uses 10 virgins to represent that this is not part of the seven Adventist church. This represents the complete, the whole church and part would be wise and part would be foolish and tonight you must answer the question whether you're a wise or a foolish version and just having a bible doesn't make you wise or foolish because even the foolish have bibles you need something more if you're going to be wise i don't know about you but i, don't, I want to be wise the bible says verse three they let's read it together they that were foolish took their what? Lamps. They took their Bibles, but they took no oil with them. You will notice in all of the parable only one distinction between the wise and the foolish. Only one. What is the distinction? Oil. What is Jesus doing? You know, sometimes we get so busy doing everything else that we try to pick up this and this and this and this and this and this, and then we miss the most important thing. Jesus said in the last days, if you miss everything else, if you only can get one thing, get oil. I wonder what the oil is. The Bible says in verses 4, but the wise took oil where? In their vessels with their lambs. Question. Where was the oil that the wise had? In their vessels. I wonder what those vessels are. Do you know what those vessels are? If you study the Bible, you'll find out that in 2 Timothy 2, verses 19 through 22, that it says that if we purge ourselves, that a man can be a vessel. Remember what the apostle Paul said? He said that we have this treasure in what? earthen vessels. Look at 2 Timothy 2. Let me show you that for a moment. We'll come right back to Matthew 25. Look at what this says, 2 Timothy 2. Let's go to 2 Timothy. What book did I say? 
2 Timothy chapter 2, notice what the Bible says, that are we wise or foolish virgin? The wise had only one difference. They had what? Oil. Where? In their... Let's wonder what these vessels are. 2 Timothy 2. Look what it says. 2 Timothy 2, beginning now and in verse 19. You're there, amen? Let's read verse 19 together. The Bible says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth how? Sure, having this seal. What seal? The Lord knoweth them that are his. You know, God knows if we're really his. And let everyone the name of the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Notice verse 20 now. We're looking for what a vessel is. And we want the Bible to explain it. Look at what it says. Verse 20. Let's read together. The Bible says, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of what? Wood and of earth and of some to honor and some to dishonor. Verse 21. If a what? If a what? If a man. If a what? If a man. Therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel. Who shall be a vessel? He shall be a vessel so that he represents man or humanity or a person so that vessel that the church had represents people that have received oil inside of them. I wonder what the oil is. Now the Bible goes on. Let's go back to Matthew 25. Let's go back to Matthew 25. Listen to what Jesus talks about. The Bible says in Matthew 25 that they were all there together. Was there a difference? What happened to those ten virgins? What happened to all of them as they went out to meet Jesus, preparing to meet Christ? They thought there was a seeming delay. And what took place? All of them, did they stay wide awake, yes or no? What did they do? The Bible says in verse 5, While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at what? Midnight. There was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go you out to meet him. Question. All of them went to sleep. Am I right or wrong? The wise and the foolish. And the only difference was the oil. Bible says at midnight, all of them woke up. One was ready and the other was unprepared. What did the foolish do? You remember what the foolish did? You read the story, those foolish said they went to the wise and they said, give us your oil. Give it to us. And the wise said, not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go and buy for your, I wonder what the oil represents. You study the Bible through and you'll find out that I wish we had time to go through the night, but we can't. I'm getting ready to close. I really, listen, brothers and sisters, that oil represents the Holy Spirit. But not the Holy Spirit outside of us. The Holy Spirit coming inside of the vessel. Inside of us. And when he comes out, you know what he does when he comes in? He produces fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. What is that fruit? It's the character of Christ. Look what this says. Look what this says now. Now I want to ask you a question. When is midnight? Is that a good question? Because at midnight, when all of those virgins woke up, it was too late for seven day Adventists to get ready. How much of the church? The whole church. The whole church, those ten virgins, had until midnight. And when midnight came, too late. And you know what's happening right now? We're sleeping and we don't know that midnight is right around the corner. Foolish virgins. Foolish virgins. Listen to what it says. Question. When is midnight? Remember now, foolish virgins, wise virgins. Midnight. At midnight, the great time crisis takes place. All of them wake up. Tell me something, brothers and sisters. What is Jesus talking about when he says midnight? You know what people say? Midnight is the second coming of Jesus. You know how many people say that? We listen to this song sometimes. You got to be careful the songs you sing. Amen. Make sure it's doctrine correct. In the midnight cry. You know they sing that song? When Jesus comes. Is the midnight crying when Jesus comes? No. How do we know? Listen now. When Jesus comes, the Bible says it's going to be like the lightning. It's going to come from the east. Even to the west. Matthew 24 tells us that. 
The Bible says Jesus likens himself to a son. Psalms 84, 11 says that Jesus says the Lord God is a son and shield. Malachi 4 says that the son of righteousness is going to rise with healing in his wings. When the sun comes up in the east, what time of day is it? Morning. So prophetically, the second coming of Jesus takes place in the morning. Are you with me? This is why we say in the Bible, the Bible says in Psalms 30 verse 5, weeping may endure for the a night, but joy come up in, the, in that great getting up morning very well. Very well. They call it the resurrection morning. Second coming takes place in the morning. So that means, brothers and sisters, if the second coming takes place in the morning, then that means that midnight is the last great prophetic event before Jesus comes. When it will be too late for the seven Adventist church to get ready. Other denominations will still have time because they don't know where we're staying. But for seven Adventists, too late. Listen, brothers and sisters, this morning is the second coming of Jesus. But what is midnight? Do you want to know what midnight is? Watch now. Because when midnight comes, those foolish virgins actually go and try to get some oil. But it's too late. Too late. It's the Sunday law. What did I say? It's the Sunday law. Now somebody says, how could a day be a voice? Because it says, the voice says... Behold, the bridegroom cometh at midnight, right? Go to the Ze Zephaniah. What book did I say? Go to Zephaniah chapter 1. The Bible tells us that a day has a voice. A prophetic day has a voice. Notice what the Bible says in Zephaniah. What book did I say? Zephaniah chapter 1. We want to notice what the Bible says in Zephaniah chapter 1. That's that little book tucked away there. Sometimes we say, oh, I didn't know Zephaniah was there. Is that right? Look what it says, Zephaniah 1, beginning in verse 14. The Bible says in verse 14, after Rebekah, Zephaniah. Verse 14, let's read together. The Bible says, the great, the great what? The great day of the Lord is near. What is it talking about? It's talking about the prophetic day, right? The great day of the Lord is near. Is near and hasteneth greatly, even the what? Even the what? Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there what? So you mean to tell me that a prophetic day can have a voice? So the voice at midnight, we're going to find out, is the passing of this Sunday law, and the world knows nothing about it. They don't know what it means. They see it, but they don't know what it means. All over the world, they're talking about Sunday laws right now. You know it's getting ready to take place in America. Brothers and sisters, look what it says. When it's midnight, look what it says. The prophet says, great Christ, I have a lesson. 4.12, it says this in the crisis, the character is revealed. When the earnest voice proclaimed at midnight, what is the voice? It is a prophetic day, right? When the voice proclaimed at midnight, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And the sleeping virgins were roused from their slumbers. It was seen who had made preparation for the event. Both parties were taken unaware, but one was prepared for the emergency, and the other was found without preparation. So now in a sudden and unlooked for calamity, something that will bring the soul face to face with death, will show whether there is any real faith in the promises of God. It will show whether the soul is sustained by grace. The great final test comes at the close of human probation when it will be what? Too late for the soul's need to be supplied. Notice she says four great Words that identifies when midnight is. Look what the prophet says. First, she says it's going to be a crisis. In a what? What is it saying? In a what? In a crisis. First word. So whatever this event is, it must be a prophetic crisis, right? Two. She says it's a prophetic event. She says it was seen who had made preparation for the what? Event. So it must be a crisis. It must be a prophetic event. Whatever, what else must it be? It must be a great final test. How do we know? It says the great final test comes at the close of what? Human probation, and it must have a connection with the close of probation. So it says when midnight comes, it's going to be a crisis, a prophetic event, a great final test, the close of human probation. It's going to be the voice of a day. What day? The Sunday law in America. What is the great final test? The whole world is going to decide between the true, uh, the true seven-day Sabbath and the Sunday Sabbath of tradition. It's going to be a test. Look what it says. The Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty. 
for it is the point of truth especially controverted when the final test shall be brought to bear upon men then the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve him not while the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, would be an avowal of allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God, the keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to the who? Which day points to the creator? The Ten Commandments, so you go to the Fourth Commandment, it says, remember the seventh day to keep it holy. Six days shall I labor and do all thy work. But then it says, but the seventh day is the of the Lord of God. Then it tells us, it says that God made heaven and earth and sea that seven day points to him as creator. Now listen now. While one class by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers received the mark of the beast, the other choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority received the seal of God. When that Sunday law is passed, man is going to have to decide between the mark of the beast or the seal of God. Now listen, the Christian world passed a Sunday law not because they're evil people, they're Christians that want to see God come back into this country. But they don't know what's getting ready to take place. Somebody says, it's not going to happen. Yes. Can I have my brother come play for us as we get ready to close? Oh, oh how he loves you and me. Look what it says now. This says, what is the oil, brothers and sisters? Look at this now. Let me go back here. I want you to see this. There are many who have what? Not yet heard the testing truth for this time. Who is this? You mean to tell me God has sheep in Babylon? Yes. It says, there are many with whom the Spirit of God is striving. The time of God's destructive judgments is the time of mercy for those who have had no opportunity to what? Learn what is truth. Tenderly will the Lord look upon them. Do you know right now the ones that pass the Sunday law, God is looking tenderly upon them because he knows they've never heard the truth, but they're longingly wanting to see God come back, and he's going to cause the third angel's message to be preached so they can be heard with clarity and power, and many ministers and members of other churches are going to study the Bible for themselves and see Jesus lifted up, and they're going to say, yes, I love you, and Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You want to say, I love Jesus. They've never heard it so clear. But right now, God cannot bring them in the seven Adventist church. You know why? Because we would drive them out. They love God too much. Christians and other denominations, while seven day Adventists have all this light and truth, and yet we're doing nothing, sleeping, lying down, loving the slumber. God says this midnight is going to wake up every seventh day after this. But it's going to be too late for many. We have but a few short months. You hear me? We have but a few short months. Listen, I wish we had time just to go down all of the papers and show you that this thing is coming. Listen, now what does it say? It says, it says he's going to look tenderly upon them. Will the Lord look upon them? His heart of mercy is touched. His hand is still stretched out to save them while the what? Door is closed. To those who would not enter Seventh day Adventists. Wake up. Help me, Lord, to wake up. Whatever we do, we must do quickly. Now is the time for the careless to arouse from their slumber. Now is the time to entreat that souls should not only hear the word of God, but without delay, secure oil in their vessels with their lamps. That oil is the righteousness of Christ. It represents character, and character is not transferable. No husband can give it to a wife. No wife can give it to a husband. No parent can give it to a child. No child to a parent. Each must secure for himself. And that's why the foolish said, give me your oil. The wise said, I can't. You can't give somebody the time you spent with Jesus. No man can secure for another. Each must for himself obtain a character. What type of character? Purify from every stain that means we must look just 
like Jesus. And I was going to go and show you what's getting ready to happen. I was going to show you the revolution that's getting ready to break out of America. You know that right now, one of the, one of the, one of the most looked after financial experts graduated from Harvard, a Harvard professor. All over the news, he wrote a book. He was the advisor for, even for uh, Mitt Romney. He wrote a book and said, he's an expert on what is called economic history, and he said that America has come to the edge and that America in 2000 reached her apex. We've been preaching this forever. He said America reached her apex in 2000, and he said she has 20 years before there's an economic collapse. I'm not here trying to set a time. What I'm trying to show you is we proved this week that this was so. Did we not prove it? We have but a few short months. And my brothers and sisters, we are not ready. If this crisis were to break, if something were to happen to us today, would you be ready right now? Would I be ready? The only way to get ready is to come to Jesus. I want to close right here. I'm just going to stop right here and say this. Somebody says, but Lord, can he help me? Can God help me? Yes. Yes. If you come to him, he can help you right now. Do you want help tonight? Did you hear the voice of God? Do you want to get ready? Do you want Jesus to help you? I'm going to give you what I think is one of the most powerful quotations in all the writings. The Spirit of Prophecy says that when this son-in-law crisis is getting ready to break, she says, will the truly faithful and obedient fall? Never. She says, not one. How many? Not one who is abiding in Christ. Where? Not one, 100% accuracy. Not one who is abiding in Christ will fail or fall. Our only safety is in Jesus. Do you want Jesus? A man that is friendly or has friends must show himself friendly. Are you friendly to Jesus? He wants to spend time with you. If today you want to help finish this work, would you reverently kneel with me? Heavenly Father, you've spoken to us, Lord. Jesus is coming. We're not ready. But we want to be, Lord. And when you bring this revival and reformation, the whole world will hear. And you're going to have a body prepared finish the work to crush the head of Satan to vindicate your character that we can spend eternity with Jesus but it starts with us receiving the character of Jesus we can't do this by ourselves Lord we've tried and failed and our only hope is in spending time learning the secret of allowing humanity to unite with divinity and so I pause the prayer there's someone here tonight that says Lord I want to make a commitment tonight I haven't been walking with you but I want you tonight. Or maybe you've been walking with him, but you know you want a deeper walk. And tonight, you want to make a commitment that you're going all the way. But you know you can't do it by yourself. You need Jesus to hold your hand. And I want you just to raise your hand wherever you are. By raising your hand, you're saying, Lord, I want your help. I want you to do something in my heart. I don't love you like I should. I mean, you may not, you may be, I remember hating the Bible. I remember being uninterested in it. But Jesus changes hearts. And all we have to do is ask him. You want him to make you, make you love him in the Bible? You just say, Lord, I want a new heart tonight. Father, you see every lifted hand, supply the fact. Thank you for what you did tonight. Keep us, we pray. And may each of us be a part of that team that finishes your work on that sea of glass. In Jesus' name, amen.